Uh, first of all, let me thank the organizers for inviting me to this great event. It's my first trip to Grand Rapids, lovely city and great university. Um, so I've been enjoying the conference uh, so far, I've enjoyed the lectures so far, and also interacting with uh, many old friends and getting to know new friends. Um, uh, I'm happy to be here to share with you some of the recent work I've been doing. So this is what I've been talking about. Uh, let me point out first that this is joint work with my current student, Xiao Chuan Tian. Uh, she's a brilliant student. Uh, she got her master from Penn State and, and went uh, to Columbia with me. I'm trying to let her graduate, but she's always saying that there's so much more she wants to study. She actually already has a number of publications. I'll be talking about some of uh, her work, a joint work with her. Uh, this, this work also has benefited from many past collaborations. Uh, Tadeli Menginza, who was a post of mine at Penn State for several years, is now a faculty member at University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Uh, Max Ginsburger, Rich LaHook are the ones that got me into this area. Uh, Quinjo is another former student, uh, but he left mathematics, he's now doing uh, finance in Wall Street. Uh, so uh, let me start with, uh, I'm not so sure how many uh, people in this audience are familiar with uh, what I call as non-local models. So I'm gonna start with something very, very simple. Uh, this is what every mathematics student would know. Uh, we are often familiar with uh, differential equations. I wrote down an ODE. Uh, if you do numerical computations, you can write down the finite difference equations. The subject of numerical analysis is really, in some ways, to look at the difference and the connections between those uh, different kind of models. Okay. But today, I want you to think about uh, perhaps what we call as a non-local uh, model or non-local operator is an integral operator. Right? Uh, I, I'm taking a very simple form. So imagine you just take this uh, difference operator with a uh, length scale s, which will be like your mesh size, but you're gonna weight that with a kernel function, omega delta. Okay, so this is not just a single finite difference. This you can think about them as a continuum weighted difference. Uh, the, the, the scale will go to, uh, from zero to all the way to some finite size delta. Okay? And, and that weight function will depend on this parameter delta. This delta in some sense uh, characterizes the range of non-local interactions because the, uh, the result of this operation not only depends on the function value and the position x, but also depends on uh, the information around x all the way up to the length scale delta. Right? Now, this non-local operator is more general than, than both differential operator and finite difference operator in the sense that if you pick a very singular supported kernel, let's say if you take that to be a, del a direct delta measure uh, and origin, right? you, you use this uh, proper sense, you recover the differential operator. And if you take that to be a direct delta now and the finite distance away from origin and some mesh point, uh, some mesh size h, you get, a, uh, get back the uh, second difference operator. Right? Uh, so we call that as a non-local uh, integral operator and the equation that gives like in this particular form, we'll refer to that as a non-local continuum model. Right? It's valid for, uh, for instance, for all the variables x on a real line. Uh, we say that perhaps it's more general because uh, you, you take those uh, cases, you get uh, both of them as special, uh, specializations. At the same time, uh, this non-local continuum model might be a good bridge, uh, bridging this uh, local continuum model. Right? Everything is determined by the function at a particular point, and, and perhaps the non-local discrete model. Right? Uh, we think about this as non-local because uh, for a given finite difference approximation, the information and point x will be related to the two neighboring points which are finite distance away. When we do numerical analysis, however, we're mostly focused on h being very small, where h really is uh, uh, going to zero, right? You're refining your mesh size. So we don't think about the non-local aspect that much. But today I want to talk about uh, what the non-local, uh, uh, non-locality will bring into this uh, kind of modeling and, and simulations. Another point I need to bring out is that uh, the equation, this integral equation, or non-local equation, allow you to have more singular solutions, all right? Because we're not doing spatial derivatives explicitly. In principle, you can have functions which are not differentiable and satisfy equation in a strong sense, point-wise sense. You don't need to have generalized derivatives to defining the equations. You can have solutions which are discontinuous, right? And, and that kind of feature might be good for some physical situations, what I'll try to relate that to, so it could make this non-local non model closer to physical reality. Okay. Um, today my lecture though 
Uh, so we're interested in non-local model uh, all the way from the modeling aspect, analysis, and also simulations. Uh, but today, my talk is actually related to how to solve those non-local equations and how to solve their, in certain sense, their local limit. Okay, so this, is the focus, this diagram is the focus of today's lecture. Um, I'm here, here having a non-local continuum model. Right? Uh, it characterized by a length scale delta, which measures the range of non-local interactions. If this delta goes to zero, you can imagine that it perhaps will reduce us to a local PDE model. So I call that as local limit, the PDE model. Right? Uh, you can also develop new home methods to solve both non-local model and solve the local model. Those will be discretized equations. And what I'm interested in looking at is the relation. As the parameter delta changes, as you refine your mesh size, what kind of solution do you expect to get? Right? The fidelity of your numerical simulation. And that, that's really the focus of today's lecture. But before I talk about this particular aspect, let me uh, go back to provide a little bit more motivation to say why we want to study non-local models. Right? Uh, discussion of non-locality, actually, it's been in, in, in the mathematics or physics literature for, for many years. You can go back to 100 years ago, the work of Rady and, and others. Right? Uh, if you do numerical simulations, well, I, I claim that knowingly, well, knowingly you, you have non-locality. Right? This is at great level, of course, as I said earlier. Uh, today, we, we heard lectures from uh, Professor Oden about coarse greening of atomic models. Um, so I will say non-locality, in fact, uh, can also be a generic feature for model reduction or coarse greening procedure. I won't go into the atomic level to, to do the illustration, but let's say we're just solving a PDE. We're solving a PDE in a domain omega, a very simple elliptic equation. But there's not a formulation that reduces the equation to an equation only on the boundary, the so-called boundary integral formulation. Now, that PDE is a local, uh, local model defined uh, at every point. But once you get a boundary integral formulation, you got rid of a lot of degree of freedom in the interior. You get a reduced model, but this reduced model becomes non-local. Right? Now, similarly, if you're doing a linear algebra, if you're doing a, a matrix reduction, you can have a sparse matrix to start always. But if you do block uh, uh, eliminations, you end up with a short complement, and that often becomes a, a, a dense matrix. So this is what non-locality comes into. So hopefully those are simple examples tells you that if you're doing model reductions, and often you may end up with, uh, with uh, non-locality. Uh, but people don't want to deal with non-locality because they think it's too complicated. And they will try to do some kind of moment closure to get back to a, a local model. Right? But lo uh, closure had a lot of issues, and the, and the, the accuracy issues and other things. So uh, uh, perhaps it's time to think more about non-local models. There are other kind of non-local models. Uh, for example, fractional diffusion equations. I, I try to come, come to this point maybe a little bit later. Right? Uh, there, there's actually a session on non-local modeling uh, in, in this conference. I'm looking forward to the lectures later today. Uh, there's certainly a lot of non-local phenomena in nature, uh, such as anonymous diffusion, uh, or stochastic processes, which are not necessarily Brownian type. You can have this generalized Levy processes and so forth. Uh, it, then you don't necessarily get the simple uh, PD models. A non-local model has been used in uh, data processing or image analysis. Right? So I, I can relate, for example, issues like uh, manifold learning or uh, machine learning, kernel representations, diffusion map. Those are really a concept in, in data analysis, uh, but they also relates to non-local models. Right? For materials, that's something I'm very much interested in modeling, materials with memory, or, or a system with delays, or biological, ecological system. There are a lot of uh, uh, examples. Right? Uh, what made me interested in non-local model actually is this particular uh, model of paradynamics. It's a model proposed by Schilling, a physicist at Sandia National Lab, uh, some years ago, to model fractures, defects. Okay. Um, so we all know that classical mechanics or cl classical kinetic models are really based on, say, for example, Newton's equation. Right? You can have this uh, 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 force balance equations. But in the cases where you model fractures and other things, you, you may be run into the situation that displacement field may be discontinuous if you want to model a, 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 a fracture. Okay? Uh, so in this case, uh, the equation has to be reinterpreted, or you have to, uh, you have to think about other uh, ways of modifying the classical equations. So Schilling had this idea of replacing a differential equation by an integral differential equation where the space derivative is replaced by a non-local interaction in terms of an uh, integral operator. And his, his vision is that this type of equation will allow you to have solutions 
which are possibly more singular or perhaps even discontinuous. And that's going to make you to uh, get it closer to model uh, issues like fracture. And indeed, this, master, this uh, model has been used uh, in many applications. Uh, there are simulations I'm showing. I'm borrowing the simulations done by a scientist and a Boeing a company or Sandia National Lab. Some beautiful simulations of, uh, you know, if you got a, a projectile hitting a target, you have very complicated fracture patterns. It's difficult to do that uh, with a traditional continuum mechanics model, but, but you know, you can do this uh, with, uh, uh, with a lot of uh, uh, very large system with paradynamics okay, on, on very big computers. Okay. And there are also some significant development effort to, to uh, develop uh, open source code, large secret code, like PD lamps, this is based on really MD code and what's called paradigm. Right? So a lot of efforts in that. Uh, but as a mathematician, I also want to advocate that uh, th this is also time to think about the mathematical theory for the uh, for the models uh, of paradynamics. We had uh, we were invited by Sam News uh, we, we, uh, with Rob Lipton. We written a, uh, a simple a small article to talk about the recent mathematical development in this area. The message is that. Although paradigms allow you to have singular solutions, and those singular solutions, perhaps they can uh, try to mimic crack and fractures. They will make, you, uh, uh, make it closer to physical reality. But we know as a computational scientist, anytime you have singular solutions, let's add computational complexities. It's much easier to approximate or, or simulate smooth solutions. It's much more challenging to uh, uh, simulate accurately uh, uh, singular solutions. So this highlights the importance of developing the mathematical theory, uh, and also uh, what I would call as robust algorithms, and you really have to do validation and verification. This is, again, a message that Pro Professor Oden has been emphasizing this morning, right? Uh, we need theory uh, to help us validate and, and verify the, the, the model and, and make them indeed simulate physical reality and not some kind of artifact of, of model simulations. So to begin with that, I'm going to start with a very simple, uh, uh, simplified model. Okay, so I won't actually get into talking about cracks or fractures. Um, just like if you want to talk about very complicated nonlinear PDEs, you start with a Poisson equation. So I'm going to give you this analog of, say, Poisson's equation in this non-local paradigm setting. So that equation, I'm going to call that as the linearized isotropic bound-based paradigm model. Uh, this is actually something that Schilling has written down in his uh, earlier papers. It's really a model of, uh, think about that as a model of a continuum of whole cooking sprints. So let's imagine we have a material system over here. At every point x, I want to write down a force balance relation at that point. And what I imagine is that within a delta neighborhood, uh, any other material point y in this neighborhood is going to connect it with x by a spring. Right? But there are infinite number of springs uh, in there. And the forces is just going to be a linear spring force, hooking spring. The force is along the, uh, the, the, the bound direction connecting those two uh, vector uh, positions. Right? So, th so that's the position of the force. And of course, it's proportional to the relative displacement. Uh, U is the displacement field. It's uh, proportional to the relative displacement and those two positions. Uh, this, uh, this omega delta is a kernel function. It's a weight. It represents some kind of material property. You can think about this uh, as uh, uh, defining some kind of constitutive relation. Okay? Now, of course, delta. Uh, it's called a non-local horizon by Schilling. This, again, defines the range of non-local interactions for you. Right, so we just imagine that we have a lot of uh, springs around x, and we have the total spring force that's going to balance out with, say, external force or uh, your other uh, kind of forces. Okay, so that's the basic balance, force balance equations. We want to solve this equation inside the material domain, but we run into a problem if the point is moving closer to the boundary, because we don't know what the displacement field uh, outside is. So we need to supplement with uh, certain, what you would say, boundary condition, typically. But because of the non-local interactions, I cannot just subscribe the displacement uh, on the boundary itself. I need to give that in a proper layer, because it uh, requires non-local interactions. So we replace that by what we call as a volumetric constraints. So let me, for simplicity, just say displacement equals zero on this delta layer surrounding the material. You don't have to specify that. Actually, you can just specify maybe on a a subset of this domain, or simply you don't specify anything at all. And then you will get naturally the analog of, say, Neumann type or traction type of boundary condition. Right? So for simplicity, I will just use this as an illustration today. 
Uh, the first thing we want to do is we're going to rewrite this equation somewhat because this equation doesn't look like a typical PDE to you. Right? So instead, we define some non-local operators. Uh, so for example, we define this operator called d star. It just looks like a finite difference operator, but it's not defined on a grid. It defined on the continuum points. It actually represents what's uh, I was, uh, said as a linear non-local volumetric string. It really tells you how much stretching you're having. And we're defining the operator D, which is like the, uh, the, the adjoint operator of this D star. Just like, you know, you have a gradient operator, you can define the divergence as this uh, adjoint operator. We'll do the same for those uh, non-local integral operators. Okay, so that's defined strictly by duality in a standard L2 sense. Then this, uh, this uh, integral equation can be rewritten uh, in a weak form, or maybe, uh, say, it's through the principle of virtual work, you can write down a bilinear form, and, and this bilinear form, rather than uh, in the standard Poisson equation, you had gradient u, gradient v. Here we have this non-local kind of gradient, a non-local gradient of v. Right? And, and instead of a single integral, we have a double integral because we got this non-locality in play over here. Right? And then you can define your standard uh, function spaces, right? and then you can start doing your variational analysis, and then you can do also your finite dimensional uh, approximations. I want to mention that there are many related works talking about how do we analyze uh, this non-local equations of this type. I, I mentioned quite a few uh, very well-known analysts in this area. Okay. So for us, our starting point is we want to develop a systematic and maybe axiomatic framework for analyzing non-local equations. As I said, non-local equations have been around for a long time, but we want to go from uh, uh, the, the approach of developing an analog of calculus, just like calculus is developed, you know, you can use that for PDEs. And let's try to develop a calculus for this non-local integral equations. Okay. Of course, the study of those non-local operators, uh, along with some uh, integral identities, they, they form a big part of uh, what we call as non-local vector calculus. This concept has been documented in a number of papers we published uh, uh, recently. Okay. And with that non-local calculus, you can go on to develop what's called a non-local calculus variation, and this allows you to study this kind of uh, non-local equations. Uh, let me summarize. I, I, I won't have time to get into the detail, but let me summarize the main features of, uh, uh, of what we, we said in this kind of mathematical framework. Typically, we used to solve uh, PDEs, but now we're solving this non-local equations. We call that as a non-local balance laws. Differential, uh, differential operators now are replaced by non-local integral operators. Uh, so if you think about a standard, say, Poisson type of equation, symbolically it's written in a very similar form. Uh, you have boundary condition on the side, then we have other non-local analog. Uh, energy, this is a typical elastic energy, and we have a non-local energy. Uh, when you do PD analysis, a lot of times you rely on integrating by parts, or Green's identity. That's a key ingredient, right? And for us, we also have duality principles. And, and we have perhaps what we call Fubini theorem. We don't really do integrating by part, but we can do a change of order of integration. So this serves as a non-local analog. Uh, with this machinery, uh, you can imagine that uh, what we used to do for PDEs, we can actually develop that for this non-local models. And you can show the problem is well posed. Uh, before, you have an equation in the domain and boundary condition. Now we have an equation in the domain with some kind of volumetric const constraints. In addition, uh, this is really, uh, uh, already well known uh, for, for shading when we develop paradynamics, is that if you make this delta goes to zero, and if you make proper choices of this non-local interaction kernels, uh, you can show that this non-local model indeed will reduce to the local PD model. Okay? But more recently, what we showed is that the solutions of the non-local model will approach the solution of a local model if delta goes to zero, and uh, this kind of convergence can be established with very minimum regularity assumption on the solutions. And let me tell you why that's important, because when we're solving this non-local models, perhaps we can encounter uh, much less regular solutions. For example, solutions which are discontinuous. Uh, they are often uh, prohibited from uh, being a solution of, uh, say, PDEs. If you have co-dimension one singularity, uh, uh, discontinuity, that's not allowed for a typical second-order equation. But here, for non-local model, we have more singular solutions. And yet, as the non-locality vanishes, the solution regains certain, uh, certain regularity, and, and they can serve as the solution of the underlying PDEs. So this kind of result was known to Schilling, but uh, he was deriving this kind of result by assuming a pseudo-solution, then you just simply do Taylor expansion. 
And of course, for non local model, we really want to justify that we can do this uh, without assuming any singularity, uh, without any, uh, assuming any regularity. And by the way, let me point out that for this very simple minded uh, bound based linear uh, uh, paradigm model, the local model corresponds to a standard model of linear elasticity. It has a very uh, a special Poisson ratio of one quarter because of this isotropic spring setup. And we have theories for more general state based models that can allow you to recover linear elasticity with arbitrary Poisson ratio. Okay? I, I just use this as a simple case for the solution today. Now, let me get down then to do the numerical uh, approximations. Uh, of course, for any of the non local models with any kind of non local interactions, you can try to develop a, your favorite numerical methods of solving it, just like you do for the PDEs. Right? And if you're good, uh, you're doing the right thing, you would uh, expect that as you refine your mesh, that H stands for the mesh size, this numerical approximation should go to the solutions you're trying to find. And it doesn't matter what kind of regularity you're, you're going to assume for the problem. Right? So this is expected. Okay. Uh, so this is, this is the scenario, right? So uh, on the claim level, if we shrink the non-locality, we get a PD model, we get a solution consistent with the PD model. And we're developing numerical methods for those models. As we refine the mesh, we get consistency as well. But the question we're asking is, what happens if you set both the mesh size small and the non-local horizon delta to be small? Okay, so if you set the parameters delta and h goes to zero simultaneously, or if you think about the top line, uh, if on the discrete level, if I'm setting delta goes to zero, would I expect to recover a discrete scheme for the PDE uh, from a discrete scheme for solving the non-local model? Okay, so what would be the answer for those questions? Okay. Uh, this is not just a mathematical question. It's actually a very important question for doing validation or verification. Okay. Well, uh, so I've been working with a lot of uh, 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 engineering colleagues recently. So I've been to a lot of conferences. Uh, International Congress of uh, Mechanical Engineers or U.S. National Congress of uh, Computational Mecha uh, Mechanics and so forth. I sit in, the, in a table with many engineers and they ask me what I, what I talk about in the conference. I said paradynamics. So uh, often I get uh, this story says, oh, paradynamics, we tried that. Or I have a student tried paradynamics. But somehow it doesn't work. Uh, so then they give it up. And so this is very interesting. Why, uh, so I start asking, why it doesn't work? Because they said that, well, we run the paradigm code, we get an answer, and then we run abacus. We use the same material parameter. The solution don't match each other. So if they don't match, we think this method is no good. Uh, even if for a very simple material, uh, it doesn't match, right? So we, I, I get curious as to why, you know, uh, it, it, for a simple model, uh, you get paradynamics, you get this consistency, mathematically, but when you put on the computer, you don't get the same, same answers, right? So what's wrong with this? Um, so that, that gets to the issue of finding numerical methods of solving, uh, solving the, the, the parameterized problem because we got a length scale delta in play, right? And we want to have a numerical methods which in some sense insensitive to the change of the parameters. And this is the big subject in numerical analysis, at least some of the uh, works in, uh, in different uh, settings, for example, solving uh, semi-classical limit of Schrodinger equations, we're doing uh, uh, a diffusive limit of radiative transforms and so forth, or even doing elasticity, right? Locking free fine element, Doug and others have done a lot of work in this area. So, so this is a very universal topic. Okay? But we're trying to do a, a slightly different problem. We say, we're going to solve the spatially non-local model, but we want to look at the limit uh, as the non-locality vanishes, what happens. So we proposed a notion of asymptotic compatible schemes, and this was the a title of my lecture today. Those are the numerical methods. When you're trying to uh, use them to discredit your non-local model, they have the feature that for a given fixed delta, they should approximate non-local model. That's what you're trying to solve. But even if you're changing your length scale, you're trying to make delta goes to zero, I want to say that if delta goes to zero, this <laughs> numerical methods I developed for non-local model actually should also be consistent in the end with the local PDE model. And this will make sure that you can validate where you can verify your numerical solutions with what's been often solved uh, when you're modeling P uh, using PDEs. And moreover, I'm also hoping that if you just take a parameter delta equals zero in your numerical scheme, we really recover the discrete schemes for solving PDEs. All right, and so, so that will give you a certain robustness 
in your local masters, and allow you to do ver verifi uh, verification validation. Of course, now the big question is what schemes will be asymptotic compatible? Uh, so Shoshan and I, we first provided some examples. Uh, and then we say, well, maybe there's a more general theory. And this general theory actually uh, can be developed for nonlinear variational problems, or, uh, you know, non-local uh, variational problems. I hope it's not an earthquake. <laughs> for, uh, using this non-local uh, calculus variations. Uh, but let me specialize that to the case of, uh, is it an earthquake? All right, no. Uh, okay, so before I, develop, before I talk about this general theory, right, so let, let, me, let me tell you some, uh, some, uh, some examples first. So the first thing is, is really a bad news for some of my engineering colleagues. Uh, because some of the most popular methods turned out they're not asymptotically compatible. And I give you two examples. Uh, if you think about solving an integral equation, of course you do quadrature approximation. You can use a simple you know, Riemann sum. You do a midpoint, one point quadrature. Turns out that kind of method is not as only comp compatible. This, of course, is the most natural method to come in mind, right? Uh, if you think about a variational problem, you do finite element. Remember I said that the, the, the solution allows you to have singular solutions, discontinuous solutions. Of course, you can do finite element with piecewise constant. Right? If, if you don't have regularity. Well, it turns out that's not going to be as not compatible. In fact, uh, one thing that people often do in practice is uh, they keep this uh, horizon delta and the mesh size to be a constant. Well, they say we need some non-locality. Let's take delta to be three or four times of the uh, mesh size so that we have enough grid points within the horizon to do the non-local interaction and, and then keep uh, still the efficiency because you can have a sparse structure. Uh, so we show that if you do that, your numerical solution will converge. Well, that seems to be good news, you get convergence. But it's even worse than, conver than, than, than something that does not converge or unstable. They converge, but they converge to a low, wrong local limit. Uh, so this is the picture it's supposed to show that this is, the, say, the in local limit, this is, will be the analytic solution. I, I just did a 1D case for illustration. And you're solving a non-local model with mesh size smaller, smaller, or delta smaller, smaller, they start to lay on top of each other. It's all this curve over here. But they are miles apart from the actual solution you're trying to find. The reason is that those numerical methods tend to overestimate your material properties, and, and, and they overestimate by constant factor relates to this ratio. And, and this factor is not going away as you refine your mesh. So they always give you the wrong solution in the local limit, even though they would be able to allow you to solve this non-local model uh, in the correct way. So it turns out for this kind of uh, scheme, if you think about this diagram, so already I showed you that along the diagonal where delta and h is proportional to each other, you run into trouble. A anytime you try to make your uh, horizon shrink faster than mesh size, you run into trouble. So you're forced to refine your mesh size much faster than the non-local interaction range, and this is the safe route and allows you to pass to the local limit. You know, many of my uh, friends or engineers' friends, they don't do that. And so when they ask the student to run the code, they take this easy short, uh, shortcut. And of course, they get results that's different from what they get from Abacus. And this is one explanation to say why they thought the master failed. It's not the master failed, it's that you're not trying to develop the right numerical masters, which are not robust enough for this kind of problem, right? Okay. So, um, and this issue, of course, uh, is a warning to say that some of the earlier co-development effort you know, really need to be re-examined because this can cause some serious issues for verification purposes. Right? Um, well, when you point out something is not good enough, uh, my friends are not happy. They, they want to know what's the alternative. So we have to provide the remedy, right? So how can you do better? How can you do something better than finite element with constant or midpoint quadrature? And this motivates us to develop more general theory. So this more general theory, again, is studying this kind of diagram. I, I want to make sure I have a commutative diagram so I can go to, uh, you know, every path will lead to Rome. I can recover this thing, right? Of course, my really goal in practice is perhaps this U delta is more physical, uh, more, more closer to physical reality, but just for validation, I want to make sure I can get that one as well, if U0 is, is good. So to have a method like this, I need to have various conditions. I try to uh, uh, explain them to you. 
So there are several conditions on the continuum models to make sure those things will be consistent with each other. If you think about the variational setting, they require you to have conditions on function spaces, bilinear forms, and the, the, the operators, right? That's very natural. And then you need to make sure that you have some properties on the approximation space. So there are conditions on the discrete level. We need to provide conditions. And on top of that, we also hope to get consistency directly on the discrete levels. So this requires additional compatibility conditions. So there are five classes of conditions, A, B, C, D, E, and they serve different purposes. I'm going to show them all to you in one busy slide. I don't expect you to read this. Uh, but let me try to highlight some of the points, because this, this is a pure uh, uh, functional analytical setting. right? So let me highlight one of the conditions. This is the condition on a discrete approximation space. We call that uh, a property as asymptotic dense property. It's actually very general for any parameterized problem. But for non-local problems, let's say we're trying to approximate uh, in the local limit, a, a, a second-order elliptic equation, where the energy space is typically a sublet space of H1, right? We need to design finite dimensional spaces, which are asymptotically dense in the H1 space. And this one allows you to have uh, asymptotic compatibility. Now, of course, you can do that if you have piecewise linear continuous element, because they form a dense space of H1 in the H1 topology, in the H1 norm. But if you do piecewise constant, they're not. Piecewise constant can approximate H1 functions in the L2 topology, but not in a strong H1 topology. All right? And so because of this reason, you actually need to require the H need to refine the mesh a little bit faster than delta. This, of course, requires a much more uh, careful analysis, but it can be done. Right? So you just cannot take H delta to be a fixed ratio, and that gets you into the wrong limit. So the message is that at the end of the day, uh, the study of this asymptotic, asymptotic compatible schemes is really changing the view of the community how we should develop code for this kind of non-local models or multi-scale models. Okay? Because if you take the simplest kind of piecewise constant or simple one-point quadratures, they're not going to give you robust methods. You need to do a little bit uh, uh, better than that. Okay? In addition, there's another property uh, it relates to this uh, function spaces, uh, this so-called asymptotic compactness. You know, to get sequences that are going to limit, you need a certain compactness. Uh, for, our, for our case, we really need some very deep theory from, say, Bogen, uh, Brzee, and Minosko they developed uh, many years ago for, for uh, uh, the non-local categorization of sobered spaces. Okay? But because we are using this kind of property, this also made, motivated us to, to develop some more generalizations of their theory and, and to apply this to other kind of problems. Okay? So I point out a few of the generalizations. For example, uh, in the, in the uh, work of uh, uh, Brzee and so forth, they're talking about a kernel their limit is going to be a direct delta measure because they're trying to solve PDs. They're trying to analyze the properties of PDs. Uh, but if our interest is uh, looking at the more general non-local model, we can think about a sequence of non-local uh, interaction measures. Their limit actually still remains to be non-local, and they're less singular. Right? So we provided a more general limit that satisfies this kind of movement conditions, right? and we have more general compactness result. Okay? Uh, what this theory can do is to help us develop what we call as a non-conforming discontinuous lurking methods, even if the underlying energy spaces require the solutions to be continuous, we can use discontinuous finite element spaces to do the approximation. Okay? And the idea is, again, is to approximate the limit integrals, okay, which uh, are a little bit more singular, using something much better, uh, for example, by integrable kernels. And if you have integrable kernels, you can use discontinuous finite dimensional spaces to do approximation. But this kind of uh, uh, cutoff require, you know, introduce another parameter. So you're trying to develop a numerical scheme, which is going to be insensitive to the parameter. So you can allow the parameter goes to infinity and the mesh size goes to zero. And using the theory of isotonic compactness, uh, you can get the convergence of your non-conforming methods. That's one illustration. Right? And we're also developing that kind of generalization to a high order methods. So if you look at this high order, uh, this, uh, this non-local energy, I was using a simple first order difference. You can imagine, let's extend that to do high order differences. Right? Uh, you can develop the corresponding mathematical properties of those uh, uh, energy spaces. And again, that motivation is, is because there have been some recent work uh, done by uh, Taylor and Stigman and UC Berkeley and, and Grady and Foster and, and, and Texas. They have developed paradigm models for beams and plates. You know, just like uh, for standard uh, continuum models of elasticity, you run into uh, harmonic, Biharmonic 
operators. And here we're going to get into high order non-local operators. So that's the mathematical theory. Uh, you know, it's going to be ready and uh, prepared for this type of high order uh, um, uh, non-local models. Um, so the size of uh, compatible schemes, uh, I think it can also be a very useful tool to develop, uh, to develop a theory for particle-based methods. In fact, there are many particle-based visualizations of PDEs. They're based on a two-step uh, two process, uh, like this method of uh, s uh, smooth particle hydrodynamics. Okay? Uh, they first try to relax the differential operators using a kernel approximation. This really gets into an integral operator form. Right? But this kind of kernel approximation is characterized by a smoothing limb. And then they start to do quadrature approximations of the integrals. Right? You can use, uh, 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 say, radio basis or, or a generalized finite element basis and so forth to the approximation. Of course, this uh, introduces a particle spacing. Okay? So really, in this kind of approximation, you have two parameters in play, a smoothing length and also a particle spacing. And if you have this kind of asymptotically compatible schemes, it's going to make your numerical scheme much more robust. And, and, and then you can use a, a good mathematical properties to describe uh, the, uh, the approximation uh, of the particular scheme, rather than using any ad hoc rules to decide how do we choose the kernel approximation or how do we choose the quadrature rules. Right? And so uh, there's some related work in this regard. Again, this is work by Foster, uh, uh, Bedisco, and Wing Kim Liu. They're trying to relate paradynamics with, reprodu uh, with uh, reproducing kernel particle masses. And also, we're trying to connect the paradynamics approximations or astronomical compatible schemes with uh, spherical a uh, smooth particle hydrodynamics. Uh, I'm trying to end my lecture so that we can get to lunch in time. Um, so let me just mention the there, there other applications. Uh, we're working on non-local models, uh, non-local phase models uh, uh, to do, uh, you know, to model uh, uh, binary or multi component materials phase transformations. Uh, traditional phase field methods uses, uh, you know, they, 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 they try to use a smooth order parameter, okay? Uh, because you have to do, we, we write down the, the free energy, it's going to involve gradient of the order parameter and so forth. But with non-local interactions, we're going to try to model this kind of uh, problems, perhaps using less smooth defined uh, order parameters. And, and this could be important, again, near material defects. And the, the underlying assumption of having a smooth order parameter or having a slowly varying order parameter like what Landau assumed may no longer be valid near material defects. Right? Another thing we're trying to move forward is what I call as non-local conservation laws. So if I write down this, say, for example, a typical scalar uh, hyperbolic conservation law of that particular form. Now, what motivates us to consider non-local models? Well, one thing uh, that uh, happens is that when you write down a PDE like this, you no longer see features like uh, upwinding. Uh, if you have a smooth solution, you don't care about upwinding. You don't care about uh, where the signal is coming from. But when you have uh, singular solutions like shocks, upwinding is a very important feature. But you only do that if you do discretization. So that on a continuum level, a PDE like this, uh, this kind of natural physical feature got lost. Right? And this is all because when we do, uh, 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 -local, uh, when we do local PDE models, we ignore certain salient natures of, of, uh, of physics. Uh, because we, we assume everything is smooth, right? And then we have to come back to say, what happens is, if it's not smooth? Uh, so we propose some uh, non-local models. For example, this is one version of that. It, it's really just like, uh, if you think about a, a, a typical finite difference good enough scheme, but we're going to weight that uh, through some kind of length scale, right? And, and this kind of weighting function, you can choose depending, again, on, on, material, on the system you're trying to model or on the material properties. And uh, this kind of things, as non-locality uh, vanishes, you're going to recover the typical PD models. Okay? But you don't require to assume, for example, entropy conditions. They are automatically built in. You can have a non-local model. They will have solutions that do not, uh, you know, they can have uh, solutions that uh, produce shock-like solutions. And, and, and all the right physical selection is already built in to this equation. Uh, you don't have to worry about, you don't have to impose extra conditions. Uh, one last thing I want to talk about is that I mentioned early on that there seems to be a, a, a community of fractional equations which can also be viewed as non-local models, right? So I just want to point out that non-local model perhaps can be a good alternative to, say, fractional models because there are a lot of issues about fractional models, how do you, how do you define the right fractional derivative and so forth, and how do you solve them efficiently, right? So I mentioned that the non-local model has a range of interaction delta. 
if delta goes to zero, recover the PD. But you can imagine to have this delta goes to infinity, and that's going to give you a global detecting model. And if you choose the kernel properly, actually you can recover, PD, uh, you can recover fractional PDEs in a So, so you can develop a theory of asymptotic compatible scheme again. So you're solving really this equation with a finite range of interaction. But as you increase the range of interaction, as you refine your grid, your solution really is going to solve these fractional equations. So uh, asymptotic compatible scheme becomes a bridge of connecting both the local model and fractional models. You can get both ends if you do the right thing. So let me summarize. Um, what we're trying to do here is really trying to develop maybe a systematic framework for, uh, for non-local models and also for their non-local discretization. Uh, I talk a few uh, of the things, non-local vector calculus and non-local castle variation, although I didn't go into depth. I uh, emphasized on this asymptotic compatible schemes because I think this is really a way to develop robust algorithms for this kind of non-local problems and, and perhaps multi-scale problems because delta in a sense is, it measures the range of uh, length scales. Uh, although the work we've done is pretty preliminary, but it's already informing the community uh, how we should develop codes for this type of problems. Right? And that's going to have an impact on the validation verification. When you get down to uh, justify the fracture experiments uh, uh, that, that done at Sandia, uh, Sandia Lab is really, uh, 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 can, be, can be justified, can, uh, can, be, uh, can be verified. Uh, we still have to work on, uh, we, have, we have still a long way to go. We have to do much more complicated mathematical modeling. Okay? But nevertheless, we think this framework also has broad applications. Okay? For example, to fractional models I mentioned, um, uh, we're trying to work uh, to connect this with discrete exterior calculus or what's called graph calculus, uh, levy processes, and many things related to data analysis. It's very helpful. And also, I think it's going to point out new ways to analyze other type of numerical methods. So with that, I will conclude, and I want to uh, thank the support of NSF and Air Force. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Zhu. We have time for a few questions. connect this to what I'm going to talk about later today. Uh, you had the example where if you use a very low order methods, they um, converge to the wrong solution as delta and h go to zero. So from my point of view, those methods are either inconsistent or unstable. Which one is it? Well, so, so it turns out that they're inconsistent. Because you, you can think about a finite element, you already built into the variational structure, right? So you have coercivity, so they tend to give you the stability in that sense. But the trouble is that uh, they are overestimating your elastic constants. So you're not getting the, the truncation error simply is not going away. It's not, it's not reduced. You get coefficients, let's say you should get elastic constant to be one, but you get three, you get four. And that constant depends on the ratio of the horizon and the mesh size. If you refine your mesh, uh, uh, if you constantly refine mesh much faster, you avoid that problem. But if you don't do that, you get inconsistency. So I think that's really a consistent part of this. But there, there are also other things, uh, you know, related to stability, right? Uh, I didn't talk about, say, mixed methods. And there's certainly work that can be done in that direction. Well, that will involve stability. I'm pretty sure that, you know, that's something that you know much better, and I'll be happy to talk to you more about that. I'll be happy to entertain during lunch. I think it's a very long morning. Oh, great. Sure. Have you ever uh, considered of some uh, hysteresis uh, phenomena in your non-local uh, approaches? Uh, so uh, that's a very good question. We actually, we are looking for, uh, we're uh, looking at a particular non-local model of, uh, of phase transformations dealing with hysteresis but it's, it's not something that's directly relevant to what I'm talking about here. So if you're interested in that, I'd be happy to talk to you privately. Yeah. Maybe one more question. Okay. 
Okay, let's thank our speaker one more time. Thank you.